The title of our upcoming experiment is Preparation and Analysis of Buffers, and as the title suggests, the focus of this experiment is on buffer solutions, which are composed of a weak acid and its conjugate base in the same solution in comparable amounts. The cool thing about buffers is that they resist changes in pH, so they provide a mechanism for pH control in solutions where we might be generating hydronium or hydroxide, say in a swimming pool or in a chemical reaction that generates hydronium or, or hydroxide where we're, we're deliberately generating those things. In this experiment, we will look at two different ways to prepare buffer solutions and compare them to see which of the two is, is more accurate. Theoretically, the two methods should be identical. However, due to various types of experimental uncertainties, we're going to see some differences. And then in the second half of the experiment, we're going to put the Henderson-Hasselbalch model to the test, which is the application of acid-base equilibrium to a buffer system to give a relationship between the ratio of the concentrations of the conjugate acid and base, conjugate base and acid, and the pH of the buffer solution. We're going to see if that relationship between the conjugate ratio and pH holds up and look at the differences between an acetate buffer system and an ammonia buffer system, which is associated with a different pKa value for the conjugate acid begin by defining what we mean by a buffer system or a buffer solution. A buffer solution is, by definition, a solution containing roughly equal amounts of an acid and its conjugate base. And our solutions here, as throughout Chem 1212, will be aqueous with water as the solvent. So we have an acid, we're going to call that HA and represent that in blue. And we have a base and we're going to call that A- minus and represent that in red. And they are present in roughly equal amounts, although they need not be exactly equal. And we'll put some constraints on the relative concentrations of HA and A- minus here shortly. So we have the acid and the conjugate base. And it is important here that they both be weak. The acid must be a weak acid, and the conjugate base, as a corollary of the acid being weak, must also itself be weak. The practical upshot of this is that the pKa of the acid, the pKa of HA for an aqueous buffer system, must fall between 0 and 14. Because pKa for HA and pKb for A-, minus, the conjugate base, sum to 14 in aqueous solutions at room temperature, this implies that pKb is also between 0 and 14. To understand what's going on chemically inside a buffer, it helps to write the acid dissociation equilibrium for HA. And I should mention that you can also base the analysis of a buffer solution on pKb and the analysis of hydroxide, but because we're going to be measuring pH, it'll be easier operationally to deal with acidity and hydronium concentration. And so let's write out that acid dissociation equilibrium, which is by now very familiar to us from the acids and bases unit. We have HA, an aqueous solution, reacting with liquid water to form the conjugate base, A- and hydronium ion, H3O+. And this is a reversible process, so we use reversible arrows to represent the forward and reverse reactions happening simultaneously. Now, in a buffer system with roughly equal amounts of HA and A-, and relatively large amounts of HA and A- relative to strong acid or strong base concentrations that we might see, one of the beautiful things is that this system resists changes in pH. And it does this because HA can react with added strong base, hydroxide, essentially, in an aqueous solution, to form the conjugate base A- without a large increase in the hydroxide concentration. In fact, the hydroxide gets consumed and forms water. In the reverse direction, if we add strong acid, the conjugate base, A- can get protonated to form the conjugate acid, HA. And this happens without a large increase in hydronium concentration, since any added hydronium ion as part of that strong acid gets converted to water. And so to a point, provided we don't completely use up the HA or A- in the buffer, buffers can resist changes in pH due to added or generated strong acid or base. In the first half of this experiment, we're going to investigate two methods for preparing buffers that should be theoretically equivalent because we're using the same concentrations of HA and A- leading to the same buffer system. In part A of the experiment, we're going to do simple direct mixing of the acid and its conjugate base. So our acid will be acetic acid, we can just call that HA for the time being. The conjugate base, A- is acetate, and this will be part of sodium acetate trihydrate. We're going to simply add both of these things into an aqueous solution. In fact, the acetic acid will already be part of an aqueous solution. And this will create a buffer system with 
relatively large and equal concentrations of HA and A- in the solution. All we did to make the buffer here is just mix the weak acid and its conjugate base in water, dissolve everything up, and we've got a buffer solution. But there's another way to create a buffer, and this is by what's called partial neutralization. Neutralization here evokes the idea that we start with either acid or base by itself, and we add either strong base or strong acid respectively to neutralize a portion of the acid or base in the initial solution. And partial here is key. We need to neutralize only a portion of the acid or base we start with in order to end up with a buffer. If we neutralize it all, we just swung all the way from an acid to a base solution. A buffer needs roughly equal amounts of the acid and its conjugate base. So for example, in part B, we're gonna start with a solution of pure acetic acid. And the concentration of acetic acid we start with will be double the concentration we want to end up with, since we wanna end up in a situation where we have equal amounts of HA and A-. A minus. In order to achieve that, we're gonna add some strong base in the form of sodium hydroxide, I'm drawing here in green, to this solution. The amount of sodium hydroxide we add will be half the amount of HA in the solution, resulting in neutralization of half of the HA and preparation of a solution with equal concentrations of HA and A- at equilibrium. Notice that this buffer system is identical to the buffer system we generated via direct mixing. The only difference, the only difference, is how we made it via reaction of HA with OH- partially rather than direct mixing of the acid and conjugate base. At equilibrium, the two systems are absolutely identical in theory. Now, of course, due to experimental errors, uncertainties, so on and so forth, they will have some small differences, and we're interested in those differences in terms of the efficacy of hitting the target for preparation of a buffer system. But theoretically, according to the theory of chemical equilibrium, these systems will be identical. Now let's move to discussing the Henderson-Hasselbalch model, which allows us to put a quantitative spin on buffers and understand how the pH of a buffer system relates to the pKa of the weak acid involved and the ratio of the concentrations of A- to HA inside the buffer. And this is actually nothing more than the application of acid-base equilibrium ideas to a system that contains appreciable amounts of HA and A- at equilibrium. So let's start by writing again that acid dissociation equilibrium equation for HA, our weak acid right here. And we know that the equilibrium constant for this process is called Ka, or the acidity constant. We can write Ka as the ratio of products of this reaction, product concentrations divided by reactant concentrations. And all of this, of course, is at equilibrium. Now, what we can do to this to get a form that's a little bit easier to work with if we're measuring pHs, which is the negative base 10 log of the hydronium concentration at equilibrium, is we can P on both sides and generate an equation that looks like this. pKa is equal to the pH minus the base 10 log, since the P operator is the negative base 10 logarithm, of this ratio, A minus divided by HA at equilibrium. And in practice, this is very, very close. In fact, close enough that we can ignore any small changes in the position of equilibrium to our initial values. So however many, for example, moles of A minus we added initially and moles of HA we had initially can be used to calculate this ratio directly. And since everything is in the same solution, even though we're writing concentrations here, number of moles works just as well. I'm gonna rearrange this equation slightly to get pH by itself, since this is often our dependent variable, and the conjugate ratio in pKa on the other side of the equation since these are things that we can tinker with by adjusting the conjugate ratio or changing the weak acid we're working with in the buffer system. So this equation is highly convenient. This is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. It provides us with a relationship between what we call the conjugate ratio, A minus concentration divided by HA concentration, number of moles also works, relationship between that, the pKa of the acid, HA, and the pH of our buffer solution. And so we can design a buffer solution with a particular pH by hitting a particular conjugate ratio in the way we prepare the buffer. Now, in practice, because we need significant amounts of A- and HA in a buffer system, there is a limit to the pH range of a given buffer system. The pKa of the weak acid is at the center of that pH range, 
pKa minus 1, minus 1 pH unit is the lowest pH we can get, and pKa plus 1 is the highest pH we can get. So this is the effective pH range for any buffer system, and getting as close as you can to the pKa is ideal. This provides the maximum capacity of the buffer to resist changes in pH due to added strong acid or strong base. In parts C and D of the experiment, we're going to put the Henderson-Hasselbalch model to the test by preparing buffers with known conjugate ratios and measuring their pHs and then essentially fitting to this equation on a graph to see if our data reflects this model equation. So the graph we're going to generate here has the logarithm of the conjugate ratio, A minus concentration divided by HA concentration on the x-axis, and the pH of the resulting buffer solution on the y-axis. And notice that this graph models the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation with pH as the y variable and the logarithm of the conjugate ratio as the x variable. We would expect a linear relationship here with a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of the pKa. In part C and D, we're going to prepare four buffer solutions with different conjugate ratios. We're going to start with our 1 to 1 solution, which was generated in part A and B. And then we're going to move to 2 to 1, 5 to 1, and 10 to 1, increasing the amount of conjugate base relative to conjugate acid. We're then going to measure the pH. And we're going to do this for two different buffer systems. The acetate buffer system, HOAC and its conjugate base, OAC minus, and the ammonia buffer system with NH4 plus as the conjugate acid and neutral NH3 as the conjugate base. Now, what should we expect for the shape of the data? when we do this? Well, we actually already touched on this. We expect a line with a slope of 1, a slope of unity, if you want to sound fancy. And what about the y-intercept? What is this y-intercept? Well, think about what happens when the logarithm of that conjugate ratio is equal to 0. That entire term underlined in green drops out, and we're left with pH equals pKa. The y-intercept here should be, theoretically, the pKa of acetic acid. For the ammonia buffer system, in terms of the slope, we expect the exact same thing, a line with a slope of 1. And what about the y-intercept? Well, now the y-intercept is still a pKa, but it's the pKa of the conjugate acid NH4+, right here. And this is going to be higher than the pKa of acetic acid, and you can see that if you look up the pKa of ammonium relative to acetic acid. In fact, it's a good idea to go ahead and do that just to give yourself a sense of where you expect these lines to intersect the y-axis when you prepare this graph. And that's parts C and D. So once we've generated and graphed this data, we're going to look at the accuracy of the results, trying to hit those accepted pKa values on the y-intercept as, as best we can. And then we're going to look at precision as the goodness of the fits, essentially. How much spread is there in my data points about the line of best fit gives a measure of the precision of our fit.